Good afternoon. Take your hymnals and turn to 461. Four hundred and sixty one, I will sing the wonder story. from John 1. We're going to say verses 1 through 6 together this afternoon. John 1, 1 through 6. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. The same bore witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. That was through verse 7, but very good. <laughs> well, let's work on... Through 9, so verse 8 and 9 kind of tie into that. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. We will do 1 through 9 together next week. Very good. Take your hymnals down, turn to 48. Another song of our dedication to sing and praise our Savior. 48, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever.
Thank you, Amber. 546 now. 546. The joy of the Lord is my strength. <coughs> pages to 541. I'd like you to go ahead and stand with me to sing this one, 541. And on that last chorus, our young people can be dismissed to Sunday school as normal. 541, he keeps me singing.
Good afternoon. Thank you, Chad and Leslie and Amber, for ministering to us this afternoon. Someone asked me if this would be a feel-good message. My response was, you can cry the entire way through and decide at the end if you want to rejoice or not. But we're going to tackle a topic that is probably front and center in a lot of people's minds, uh, especially today. The title of this message is Spiritual Panic or Spiritual Peace. And if you watch the news, you listen to the radio, there's a lot of information that comes out that can be unsettling. You talk to lost people and many of them are very worried. You talk to some Christians and there's concern about what's going on, whether it be in China, Iran, or wherever the case may be. And I want us to turn our attention to Exodus chapter 14. We read this a number of weeks back in our Bible reading. And we're going to spend our time this afternoon in Exodus chapter 14. We're actually going to start in chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. We're going to start there just to give us some context. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. And this is where we will start. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had left the, let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you. And ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahirath, between Migdal and the sea, over against Belsavon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. And Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this? Why have we let Israel go from serving us? And he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the ch children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pihahirath before Baal-Zephon. After being released by Pharaoh, the children of Israel, they're being led out by the Lord out of the land of Egypt. And he has them turn in their path. And they find themselves encamped by the sea. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. The movements of the children of Israel has them thinking they are confused and wandering about. 
So Pharaoh takes his men in pursuit of the children of Israel. And this brings us to verse 10. And we're going to focus here on the next five verses. But starting in verse 10, it says, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They were sore afraid. They lifted up their eyes and they started looking around. And they were looking at their circumstances. And they became fearful. They had just been delivered from slavery by the miraculous acts of God. And here they are with the Red Sea before them, a vicious foe behind them, and they think they have nowhere to turn. They believe the situation they found themselves was dire. And rather than being driven by the awe of God, terror, fright, and horror gripped them. Their words and actions were no longer controlled by a fear of God, but a fear of what they saw. It was controlled by panic and anxiety. They lashed out at Moses and they blamed God, sarcastically asking if there were not enough graves in Egypt. Their thoughts now clouded with doubt. They suggested they would have been better off staying in slavery to the Egyptians. This, despite just having been delivered out of Pharaoh's hand by God's grace. Their hearts turned to rebellion. Panic is defined as sudden, uncontrollable fear or anxiety, often causing wildly unthinking behavior. Thoughts of anger, bitterness, dismay, apprehension, hastiness, and despair are all common for those who panic. Spiritual panic is the powerful emotion caused by the upsetting of our desired circumstances that leads to sinful assessments, sinful attitudes, and sinful actions, resulting in devastating consequences. Spiritual panic attacks the character of God because it questions his sovereignty. It questions his faithfulness. It forgets and distorts our memories of the past, casts doubts on the future, and focuses on one particular aspect of the present, while often isolating those gripped by it from reality. Spiritual panic can be subtle, muted, or it can be loud and emphatic. We oftentimes think of panic as external hysterics, but that's not always the case. It can manifest itself in thoughts of doubt that sow discord in the soul. But it still comes down to a heart that is turned against an almighty God. It leads us to compromising biblical principles as we grasp for something to right the situation we find ourselves in, doing things or allowing things we would never have chosen in the past. It's easy to look at the children of Israel and ask the question, well, how could they forget? This just occurred. But I think if we're honest and in our own life, are we not capable of that? How do we respond? How do we respond when we lose a loved one, whether it be sudden or not? How do we respond when someone walks out the door? turns their back on us? How do we respond to the medical diagnosis we didn't see coming? Do our thoughts go that God doesn't care and that he abandoned us? 
Do we respond with trust for God or doubt? When we doubt God, we can quickly turn to our own fleshly resources. Charles Spurgeon summarized our fleshly responses as the following. Despair whispers, lie down and die. Give up. Cowardice says, retreat. Go back to the worldling's way of action. You cannot play the Christian's part. It is too difficult. Relinquish your principles. Precipitancy which is rashness or suddenness of action, cries, do something, stir yourself. And presumption boasts, if the sea before you, march into it and expect a miracle. We can all fall into spiritual panic, and we can all rely on what we have available to us, our flesh. Like the Israelites who at that moment focused on the situation around them rather than on the Lord, the one who brought them out of Egypt, we too can find ourselves concerned with situations and circumstances rather than having our affections set on Christ. In that state, when trials come, we will spiritually panic. In times of trial, a heart that is oriented horizontally will be gripped with spiritual panic. But there is another way. That's God's way. And that's found in the next two verses. Look with me now at Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today Ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Moses hears them, encounters their fear and unbelief with faith and trust. He says, fear not, stand firm, be still, see the salvation of the Lord. He is going to fight for you today. He reminds them that the Lord has been fighting for them from the very beginning and has not forsaken them now. And he redirects their eyes from the Egyptians in the sea to Jehovah. He basically says, stop looking at what is going on around you and look up. The answer is always up. The answer is always found above. In times of trial, a heart that is fixated vertically rests in spiritual peace. That's where our fixation needs to be, not on our circumstances here. True peace only lasts, true peace only rests in one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our rock. He is our foundation. He is the one we can stand upon and not be shaken. The thought process that earthly comforts and stable situations provide a peaceful life is worldly thinking peddled by the evil one. And it has no place in the believer's mind. And yet we can easily succumb to such thoughts when we put our treasure in the wrong place. We value the wrong thing. Turn with me to the book of Job. The book of Job. We're very familiar with Job, but I just want us to spend a little time this afternoon looking at that. There are other examples you could go to. Habakkuk, man's crying out to God. He's saying, look at, look at what's going on around here. And God answers him and says, it's going to get worse. In three short chapters, though, by the end of the third chapter, he's praising God for who he is. Because he turned his focus and says, I'm going to look to you, God. I want us to just start in Job chapter 1 and look at verse 13. We know the context here. But I want us to read through what befalls Job. 
And starting in verse 13, it says, And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger under Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. I, am, I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Job has just lost all of his possessions. He's lost his sons and daughters. We continue on in verse 20, and it says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job's response, on one hand, is one of grief and sorrow. Cropping of hair and tearing of one's outer garment were common gestures of violent grief back in biblical times. Weeping and wailing were common acts associated with grief as well. And let us not think that Job didn't weep. I think Job cried. I think Job wept, perhaps uncontrollably. But in that, he also did something else, and he worshiped and praised God. Despite his loss, Job wasn't consumed with bitterness or anger. He didn't fall apart. Spiritual panic was not allowed to set into his life. He looked to God and says, blessed be the name of the Lord. We go on and pick up again in verse, or chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and excuseth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him, a potsherd, to scrape himself withal. And he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as the one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God 
and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. His body is now afflicted. Pain has taken over. Some of you have broken bones. I, I have never broken a bone. I've had kidney stones, and I can tell you they are extremely painful. I had a woman tell me this, was a woman. She said it's worse than childbirth. I'll take her word for it. <laughs> but I remember being gripped with that pain and not knowing what was going on the first time and trying to think clearly and trying to recall memory verses and how hard that was to be able to focus. Here's a man who's got boils all over his body, scraping them open. And he's still praising God. He is still not falling apart. He has never lost sight of who God was. He's thinking about how merciful God is to him. He says, God of mercy. Should I only accept his mercies and praise him when they don't come? What goes through our minds when physical suffering comes? Job's not panicking. He's turning to his refuge, his fortress. Patience and faithfulness are coming forth from his character. And he's choosing to exalt God. A soul resting in spiritual peace is going to do three things. And you may think of more, but I want us to, in our time we have left, is think on these three things. And the first one, he's, he's going to remember God's character. Or we could call it trust. It's important for us to remember who God is in times of trial. The Israelites quickly forgot who their shepherd was leading them out of Egypt. The guiding shepherd is always with his sheep, and as a result, as a result, they are provided for and protected. Years later, David would write the 23rd Psalm. And he speaks in five words about a great shepherd. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. He spends the rest of that psalm talking and describing in detail that great shepherd. Turn with me there. Psalm 23. Turn with me to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Fear no evil. Though we walk through turbulent times, we never are alone. Our shepherd is with us at all times. A believer can trust in knowing that God is guiding us on our pilgrimage here. He's providing and protecting for us daily. The shepherd provides everything the believer needs. And we will dwell with him forever. Now, does that mean we have insight into everything the Lord is doing? Well, no. Joseph is a great example of that. We don't. And there are valleys that are there for our benefit and God's glory, but if we're honest, we would not naturally choose to go through them if we knew what they were. We need to trust the one who saved us to continue to lead us along. And that trust blossoms when we reflect 
on his character when we trust him. A heart filled with a preoccupation with our great shepherd remembers his character and it settles the soul. Number two is recount God's mighty works. Or we could say thanksgiving. Turn to Psalm 106. Psalm 106. We're not going to read the entire psalm, but I want to look at the first 12 verses. I want to look at the first 12 verses of Psalm 106 because it ties back to Exodus 14. The psalmist is recounting Israel's rebelliousness and the Lord's deliverances time and time again. Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly. This is where it starts to tie back to the Red Sea. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up, so he led them through the depths as through the wilderness, and he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies, and there was not one of them left. Then believed they his words, and they sang his praise. Spiritual panic sets in when tribulation comes, and I'm not reflecting on God's faithfulness. I'm not reflecting on what he's done in the past or promised to do in the future. We have God's word. We have the testimony of saints throughout history. We have our own story. Think back to all the answered prayers in your life. Praying for a wife, a spouse. Praying for children. How many prayers has God answered in your life? And how often do you think back on that answered prayer? Think of being brought to the point of a broken and contrite heart and receiving the gift of salvation. Did you deserve it? Did you earn it in any way? And I ask that because we need to remember we could not have earned it. It was through a wondrous God. And have we forgotten what we were saved out of? Do we think we were okay? I wasn't. I was saved out of sin. I was saved out of spiritual death. And I have no desire to go back to it. But I should remember from whence I came what I have been saved out of. And reflecting on that and rejoicing in that and offering up praise to God. Praise should be pouring out of our mouth in our prayers. We can't rest in God if we choose not to recount what he has done because it will be a what have you done for me right now. What are you doing for me at this moment? 
a heart filled with a preoccupation with the Lord above recounts his mighty works and it calms the soul. It calms the soul. Look back at verse 8 in Psalm 106. It says, Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. Psalm 23 talks in verse 3. He talks about he's leading us. The still waters, the green pastures, for his name's sake. The third one would be recalling God's purposes or submission. We're slaves. We're ambassadors. We were bought at a price. And when we are bought, we become his. And a slave is not concerned about his own interest. A slave is concerned about the master's. That needs to be my focus. Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10 says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Spiritual panic is a result of a heart that values something else more than God. Spiritual panic is the result that has foregone his purposes in lieu of their own. It can't be about me. It has to be about him. I need to see things like that. I need to see things as he sees them and not how I see them. A lack of submission to God's rule in my life is going to lead me to spiritual panic because I'm going to be looking around at what's going on here and not up there. When we are consumed with our own interests, wants, and desires, and those become threatened, that's when the anxiety and worry starts. It takes hold of us. But doing the will of the Father brings us to peace. A heart filled with a preoccupation with the Lord above recalls his purposes satisfying the soul. It has to be about him. It can't be about me. We need to recall God's purposes. We need to recount his mighty works. We need to remember his character. Remember who God is, his faithfulness. The reality is every one of us is going to be confronted with a Red Sea in our life. Some of you already have. Some of you have been through multiple ones. Some of us have more to go through. And there's a refinement that goes on in these. But there is a way forward. Exodus 14, you go back there. He, in verses 15 through 18, God tells Moses, he says, tell him to go forward. You've looked up. I'm telling you now. Go forward. Here's the way. It's my way. I am going to do this. We will never see the way forward if we're not gazing at Christ, though. And until we do, we're going to wander in a wilderness of spiritual panic filled with anxiety and worry, restlessness, doubt, and bitterness. And that's not what God has for us. It's not what God intended for us. Spiritual peace resides in the sanctuary of God. Turn with me to Isaiah 41. Isaiah 41. Just a few more verses as we finish up 
this afternoon. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. We're going to encounter difficult situations. We can turn to prayer. We should be surrounding ourselves with prayer in these circumstances. We need to be running to our Savior at all times. We've got to stop looking around. We look at others. We look at what's going on in different parts of the world. We look at what's on the television. We hear what's on the news. None of it settles the soul. But I can open up God's Word each and every morning and throughout the day, and I can be settled. I can go to the Lord in prayer, cast all my cares on Him, and be settled. Philippians 4 6 and 7 say, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now a verse or two before that it says rejoice. Again I say rejoice. How do we rejoice in spiritual panic? We can't. But I can rejoice in whatever situation I'm in when I am communing with God. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The only fear we should have is an awe for God not fear of this world, not fear of anything that's going on around us, but a spiritual peace that rests in Jesus Christ. When we enter into the throne room of God with humility and reverence, remembering and praising God for his character and mighty works, focusing on his purposes, while our situation does not change, Then and there, our master calms our soul, silencing any potential for anxiety and worry, making any necessary adjustments to our perspective, and bringing us to the point of spiritual peace. God has given us a firm foundation. We have to decide whether we're going to choose to look up and rest in them. That's where our hope rests. It's not here. There is nothing here for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have no reason to panic. Lord, you have given us a firm foundation. We need to come into your throne room and rest there. Petitioning you. Praising you for what you've already done. Remembering your character. Father, and submitting to your will. Father, that when our circumstances seem dire, What comes forth is not dismay, it's not bitterness or anger, 
towards you or anyone else. But love and thanksgiving. Praise for your holy name, for your mercies to us in our life. Father, that our thinking would change, that we would have spiritual peace in you. We praise you for this day, Lord, and pray this all in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. It seems fitting, if you would. We'll sing this better if we stand. Hymn number 578, How Firm a Foundation. Number 578, How Firm a Foundation. dismissed.